good to see you guys here today. Thank you for joining us. If I've never had the chance to meet you, my name is Michelle, and I have the joy of being married to our lead pastor, Pastor Jeff. So we've got a great service planned for you today. And um, the way today is gonna work is we're, moms are taking over today, okay? So you're not gonna hear from just one mom, you're gonna hear from five of us. And so I'm gonna introduce them. And as they come out, just give them a hand. But we have Janelle Johnson. Janelle is mom to Ava Grace, and she's married to Aaron, who's on staff here at LifePoint. Aaron keeps my husband straight, he's his assistant. Uh, next we have Elizabeth Hughes. Elizabeth is mom to Lincoln, and she's married to Jeff, who is our director of outreach here at LifePoint. And then Leland. Welcome Leland, actually, I forgot to do that. Leland, we're glad you're joining us, but I stole from you this morning, Stacy Baisden, all the way from Leland. She is mom to three kids, um, Jaden, Emerson, and Evan, and she's married to our campus pastor, Jason, out in Leland. And then welcome Hannah Walters to the stage. <laughs> Hannah is mom to Deacon and twins, Glory and Shepherd, and Hannah's married to Daniel, who's an associate pastor here at LifePoint. So things are gonna flow a little bit different today. Each of these ladies, we're gonna have six minutes and we're gonna share what God has done through us and in our stories, and um, we just hope it's an encouragement to you. So take out your note cards and be prepared to write some stuff down, even though you're not a mom, or you might not be a mom here. Um, we still believe that what's gonna be said today will connect with your hearts. And um, so help me welcome first up, Janelle Johnson. Have you ever wanted something so much it consumed you? Moms, I'm talking about something more consuming than getting that first cup of coffee in the morning. Something you want so badly, it's all you can think about. That's something you would do anything to have it. 10 years ago, Becoming a mom consumed me. There had never been anything I wanted more. And after months of trying to conceive turned into a year, we began consulting with specialists and undergoing lots of testing, only to learn that we would not become parents naturally. If we wanted to have a biological child, we would need to undergo in vitro fertilization, or IVF. If you aren't familiar with that process, it's so emotional, not just because of all the hormones you're pumping into yourself, but it's emotional. It's painful. I mean, imagine giving yourself the flu shot every day for months, and it's expensive, y'all. It's buy a new Toyota expensive. And I would love to tell you that once we made that decision, it was an easy road, but it wasn't. Our first IVF cycle was unsuccessful, leaving us so heartbroken. We did what we knew to do, and that was surround ourselves with strong believers that prayed for us, they cried with us, and they spoke biblical truths to us. We were determined that during this waiting time, it would not become wasted time. I found a scripture that was exactly what I needed to stay focused on God's plan. In Philippians 4, the Apostle Paul says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That's exactly what I needed, peace. There are three really simple things that stand out to me from this passage. One, don't worry about anything. Okay, easier said than done, right? I'm a natural worrier. I can be a bit of a self-professed control freak. So when I can't control, I feel really uneasy. And I had no control over our circumstances. There are days I would wake up and the fear would just creep in and say, maybe you'll never be a mom. And I would just say to myself over and over again, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Two. Pray about everything. I prayed boldly for a baby. 
God and I were so tight at this time. He knew how badly I wanted this, but he also knew and loved me during the times when I was just mad. I was frustrated. I didn't understand why we were having to go through all of this. And I think God could take all of that anger and frustration I felt as long as I continued to bring it to him. Three, thank God for all he's done. I had so much to be grateful for. I thanked him for my awesome husband, my great job, my beautiful home, my family, my friendships, and I praised him in advance for what I knew only he could do. Even if we didn't have the baby we wanted so badly, we had so much to be thankful for. Don't worry about anything, pray about everything, and thank God for all he has done. On January 30th, 2012, we were overjoyed as we welcomed Ava Grace to our family. <laughs> Ava was a result of our second round of IVF, and she's such a gift. But it didn't take us long to wonder if God didn't have more for our family. So when Ava was nearly two years old, we decided to do another round of IVF. We were thrilled to learn that Ava was gonna be a big sister. But that celebration quickly became sadness as we learned I was miscarrying. So now here we are, again heartbroken, but also a bit conflicted. We didn't feel peace about another round of IVF or about exploring adoption as a way to build our family. Neither option felt right but neither did having Ava grow up as an only child. So I'm the youngest of five. My siblings are some of my best friends. I couldn't imagine Ava not having those relationships, a little brother or sister to tease and just share secrets and eye rolls at their dad's bad jokes. I mean, not mine, mine are good. <laughs> but then God did what only he can do and he shifted our eyes. And after lots of tears, we started thinking, Maybe this was enough. Maybe this was God's plan for our little family of three. It wasn't my plan. It wasn't my husband's plan. But could we open our minds to that this was God's best plan for us? After Paul gives us instructions for peace, he goes on to say, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. If Paul tells me he has the secret to being content, I'm gonna lean into that. Because how can we be content in a world that's constantly telling us what we have is just not enough? When Aaron and I first got married nearly 12 years ago, we were asked all the time, when are you guys gonna start a family? But we began our family when we got married. We were already enough. Then when Ava was born, people asked all the time, when are you gonna give her a brother or sister? But Ava was enough. Life can be so messy, unpredictable, pretty disappointing at times. Paul tells us there's a secret to being strong and content, whatever our circumstances. And know this, our man Paul, his circumstances were super rough. He was imprisoned, beaten, and shipwrecked. But if Paul was able to find contentment, then we can too. Not because of how strong we are, but of how big God is and how good his plans are for us. Regardless of our circumstances, we can always know that God is still God and God is still good. Sometimes I make plans and everything goes exactly according to my plans. And sometimes I make plans and everything goes horribly wrong. I waited a long time to become a mother. And so when I finally did become pregnant, I started making my plans. At that time, my husband Jeff and I were living in Nicaragua as missionaries. And so my first plan was to come back to the United States to have my baby because I wanted to be comfortable. And Jeff really felt like we were supposed to stay in Nicaragua to have the baby. And so I wrestled and fought quite a bit with God about that one. 
Um, but finally came to the realization that that was what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to stay there to have the baby because it was a part of his story. The other thing I wanted to do or started making plans for was to have natural birth. I really wanted to have that experience. And so I did everything that I felt like I could to prepare for it. We found somebody who was willing to Skype with us every week to go through childbirth classes and um, I ate right and I exercised and I did everything that I felt like I was supposed to do to prepare for that. So the time came for closer for the baby to come and Jeff and I lived in a rural part of Nicaragua. And so if I was gonna have the baby in Nicaragua, at least I was gonna have him in a hospital that resembled a hospital in the States. And so we rented a place down in Managua, which is the capital there. We went down about a week before the baby was due and just kind of waited for him to come. So I went into labor and we were looking for some specific signs that we had learned about in order to be the signal to go to the hospital. But after more than 24 hours, those signs hadn't come yet. And so we called the doctor and he said, go ahead and come into the hospital and we'll check you out. So we went in and he looked at me and he said, the baby is in distress. You're gonna have to have an emergency C-section. And I remember being in pre-op and I remember just crying thinking, I'm afraid for my baby, is he gonna be okay? But also, I felt like everything that I had just planned for just came crashing down. So Lincoln was born and he was struggling to breathe. He had to be rushed to the NICU and Jeff went with him. They were afraid for what had happened to his lungs during that process as well as his heart because a lot of stress had been put on his heart. And so they gave him medication and just a little fun fact about my son, the first medicine that he ever received was to help his heart, which was Viagra. So <laughs> when I finally got to see him later that day though, um, I was wheeled into the NICU and um, I couldn't even stand up to hold him. So all I could do was touch his little foot because I couldn't stand. And I just kept thinking, this is not the way that this was supposed to be. But I had a tremendous amount of peace about him. God just gave me peace that he was gonna be okay. But I beat myself up. I beat myself up for not being able to do what I had wanted to do, what I had planned to do, what I had so badly wanted to do. But Lincoln did recover, and four days later, we were able to take home a perfectly healthy little boy and begin to learn what it meant to be parents, which we're still learning. But then came the process of breastfeeding, which to be honest, I was really nervous to even say that word from up here because it's not something that you talk about a lot. But it was a real struggle for me. And every time I had to give him a bottle, I thought, what is, what's wrong with me? Why can't my body do this? But I knew in my heart that that way of thinking that that wasn't right. So I prayed, I read my Bible, and I was spoken into by a lot of people who really loved me. And I began to realize that I was believing a lie, a lie that I wasn't enough. 2 Corinthians 12, nine through 10 says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The truth is, is that alone, I wasn't enough but with Christ living in me, I am. I am exactly the mom that God created for Lincoln. I had what I needed, and wherever I was lacking, wherever I was weak, God would fill in those gaps through his strength. John 16, said, we will experience hardships in our lives. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. We all will have moments where we feel like we have failed. We feel like we are not enough. We feel like whatever plans we've made go completely wrong. And during those hard times, we have a choice. We can either choose to allow Satan 
to use those against us to defeat us and bring us down, or we can choose to allow God to use them for good and for his glory. All throughout that period of time in my life, God took care of us. He put people around us that took care of us. He put an amazing pediatrician that cared for my son. He put doctors and nurses and hospital staff that even though they didn't speak the same language, they took care of us. He put our fellow missionaries around us to care for us. He healed our son, he healed me, and he helped me to learn that no, no matter what happened, that I could always trust in him. So I don't know if they showed the picture. Can we, there we go. Um, isn't that a pretty picture? Oh my gosh, we nailed it. We nailed it. Every time I see it, all I can remember is the 150 degrees in North Carolina on a farm in July and the bribery that I had to do to get those children to all look and smile at the same time. I'm sure none of you can relate to that. <laughs> um, speaking of relating moms, I'm sure that during your first pregnancy, you probably were given the gift of a very special book. It's the Bible of Pregnancy called What to Expect When You're Expecting. Anybody? Your great aunt gave it to you, your, your obstetrician gave it to you, you inherited it from a friend. Well, I thought I would do a little play on that. So what did I expect and what kind of came at me as unexpected? So I read the book, I'm pregnant with my first child 11 years ago, and one thing I expected was to have morning sickness, okay? Most mo moms go through this, that's just what I was told I was gonna experience. No, 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 I had evening sickness. So I would wake up feeling great, energized, ready to go, five o'clock hit every day, and I was gone. I had to send my husband out to eat dinner, and when he came home, he had to shower because I could smell the food on him, and so it was banned. Another thing I expected was back pain. You know, you're carrying a heavy load, your back's gonna hurt. I didn't have back pain, I had carpal tunnel syndrome. Like, I don't even understand that. Like, how are my wrists in pain from being pregnant? But it's true, and I had it with all three pregnancies. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, one thing I expected, the sweet baby smell. You know what I'm talking about? No, 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 I smelled sour milk all the time. I smelled like it, my son smelled like it. Everywhere I went, I smelled sour milk. One thing I expected was a little baby, a little bit of laundry. No, I have not seen the bottom of my laundry basket in 11 years. <laughs> One thing I did expect that was a pleasant surprise, I expected to not have any sleep and the sleepless nights, but my first child slept through the night and napped. He still is a good sleeper. You're jealous, right? Notice I didn't say my second and third child, <laughs> just my first one. We all expect our children to be special and unique and a gift. And I went into my first pregnancy expecting a special child. What I didn't expect was having a special needs child. So a little bit of my story, I'm a third grade teacher and I have sat on many, in a, many a meeting and talked with parents about their child. And I found myself when I was three weeks away from delivering my second child, my daughter, sitting on the other side of that table being told that Jaden, my first child, who was three at the time, had autism spectrum disorder. And even though my mom gut had been telling me this for a while and I suspected it and would ask, just hearing those words, I mean, it was like somebody shot an arrow and it just pierced. And I fell apart. I completely fell apart and I went somewhere dark really quickly. And, you know, moms, 
unfortunately, a lot of times when we get a bit of bad news, it's like worst case scenario. And that was all I could think was, you know, this, this, this plan that I had for my child and his future and college and marriage and grandchildren and all of the things that he was going to experience. I had this sudden paradigm shift and it was, it was uncertainty now that I was looking at. I was being told all the things that my child was not going to be able to do, the things that we were going to struggle through, and I fell apart. And I remember Jason, my husband, saying to me one day, several months later, I've heard from the Lord, and he is going to be okay. And I'm like, well, God didn't tell me that. I mean, I didn't hear that at all. But he said it with such assurance and certainty that I could not deny that Jason had heard from the Lord. And I've clung to that. And it hasn't been all unicorns and rainbows. I mean, we're, he, my son's almost 11 years old in June, and it's been struggle. And I'm telling you, you know, the struggle bus, I've been driving it a lot of times, not just riding on it. It's been difficult. But one thing that I have stuck to was the promise that God told Jason that everything was gonna be okay. Let me read you this verse. It's Psalm 119.50. My comfort in suffering is this. Your promise preserves my life. And I really felt like that when I read that, that the words that Jason told me that Jaden was gonna be okay was like that life preserver, that it was being thrown to me and that I didn't have to swim and tread and feel like I was drowning but that I could hold on to the promise. In Psalm 119, 76, it says, may your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise to your servant. And when I was in that dark place and I was struggling with the unknown and that unexpected, unexpected circumstance, I could learn to trust in his promise, not their prognosis, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm not naive enough to say that I don't have to rely on therapists and awesome pediatricians and awesome teachers that have brought my son so far, but I know who I can rely on. Because when I start focusing on the prognosis and the plan that I had, then I start seeing all of the struggle, all of my problem. But when I look at him, at the promise he gave, at the promise he spoke over our son, then I start looking at who the person who is going to deliver me from my suffering, who is going to give me strength when I need it, who I can depend on time and time again, who's never going to fail me. Through it all, I've seen and I've struggled through parenthood, as many of y'all have probably experienced not just with a special needs child, but just anything that you've met with that's been unexpected. But all of my children, when I look at all three of them, they're a testament to God's goodness, to his faithfulness, and a reminder that his promises are true and that we can trust him. My oldest child is graduating in 28 days. He's the guy on the right there, Riley. And he'll be um, 18 in three days. So to say that this is a new season in my life is completely true. And I'm kind of going into it a little um, nervous and trying to hold it together. But you don't have to be a mom for the words of our last song to ring true. The words say, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. And guess what the voices inside of my head are saying? You haven't given him enough. You haven't taught him enough. You haven't trained him enough. You haven't prepared him enough to maybe leave your house soon. Where is this voice coming from? It's not coming from my son. He's not telling me these things. You probably don't have voices telling, or people in your life telling you that you're not enough. But it's just coming from the way our world is. Our world says if you can't have a baby, you're not enough. If you don't feed your kids all organic food, you're not doing enough. If you're not working three jobs to send your kids to this school, or if they're not playing 
all the sports and piano and voice and art, you're not doing enough. The pressure is real and the voice is constant, but the Bible says there's hope. We don't have to let these thoughts run our life. Romans 12, two says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In a world where we wear busy as a badge and our response is not being enough is to work harder or to do more or to live overwhelmed, I want us to take just a minute and just to sit in this space, in the quietness of this place, and just allow God's word to wash over us, to renew our minds and remind ourselves who we are. I'm gonna give you some declarations, and I love doing this. I love writing on the mirror. I love seeing them every day, but I just encourage you to write on your mirror. Speak this over yourself every day, and just remind yourself every day who God says you are. Number one says, I am loved. Romans 8, 37 to 39 says, do you think anyone is gonna be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today, tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love. Number two, I am strong. Ephesians 6 says, God is strong. He wants you to be strong. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over with the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. Janelle already shared Philippians 4, 13, but I love the amplified version, which says, I can do all things. All things is that which he has called me to do. Through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient or I am enough in Christ's sufficiency. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. We get our strength. We get our knowing that we're enough through God's strength. And number three, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. You are not in alone in this um, journey of life, this journey of motherhood. At LifePoint, we are real people and we struggle with real things, real challenges, but we're chasing after a very real God. When you face any kind of difficulty, Satan wants nothing more than you to feel alone, isolated, that you're the only one going through this. You're embarrassed, he wants you to feel trapped, but you're not the only one who's dealt with infertility. You're not the only one that's lost a baby. You're not the only one who's had your plans come crashing down around you. You're not the only one who has a child who's received a diagnosis. You're not the only one to think you're too young to be a grandmother. You're not the only one who's lost your mom. You're not the only one that has a child with an addiction. You're not the only one to think you're a failure. Don't go through life alone. Make a connection, join a team, join a group, and let's do life together. When you share your story, you open yourself up to receive help. You can gain freedom and God can use you to encourage others going through the same thing. I was one of the people that Janelle came to when she was struggling with infertility. I could cry with her, I could pray with her, I could encourage her, but I could not say, I know how you feel. But there are people in this room that could say that to her and that she leaned into in that area. And now that God's worked through her in her journey, she's helping some of you guys walk through this as well. God can use your story to give hope to others, so don't do life alone. Second Corinthians 1, 3 says, all praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel, he comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. So write these on your mirror, speak them to yourself every day. I am loved, I'm strong, and I'm not alone.
I want to share a story really quick with you guys, and it's meant a lot to me and my family in the current season that we have been walking through, and it's found in 1 Kings 17, and some background on really quick is that there is this man named Elijah, and he is just given this word from the Lord that there is going to be this severe drought, which means it's going to affect the livestock and the crops and just people in general. It's going to be a really devastating time. And so after he gives this really positive word, he goes out into the wilderness, it says, and um, camps out by the stream. And the Lord brings birds to feed him bread and meat. I mean, like, that's crazy. God can do anything. In my mind, I picture them as like Disney cartoons bringing meat and, and bread in a basket. And that's probably not how it happens. But he was hanging out there. And then the Lord said, hey, go to this nearby village, and there you're going to meet this widow, and she's going to feed you. And so I want to pick up in verse 10, and it says, so he went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me a little cup of water? Which I think is funny, because as a mother, you can probably relate to being in the middle of something and someone asking you for a cup of water. And you're like, are you serious? Like, I'm cooking dinner. But anyway, so she's collecting sticks, and he asks for water, and so she, she goes, and it says, as she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in this house, and I only have a handful of flour left in the jar, a little cooking oil, and the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I are going to die. So here's what we know about this woman. She's a widow. She doesn't have a husband. Um, so that means she's a single mom. Like she is raising her son by herself and providing for him. In my mind, I think she's probably been rationing her food, like not wanting her son and her to perish in this time of drought. And so as she's collecting the sticks, I think she's probably heartbroken. Like she's about to go home and cook this last meal. She's at the bottom of the barrel. How many mamas in here can relate to feeling like you don't have anything left to give? And that's where she's at. She's probably disappointed that she wanted something more for her son's life that she's not able to give him. Uh, maybe even angry. It's not turning out the way she thought it was going to. So it says, um, picking up in verse 13, Elisha said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what you have left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rains for the crops to grow again. So she has a choice. She has a choice. She sees what she has in her hand, which is just enough, but she can control that. Like, she could, she could make that. Or she could do what this strange man is asking her to do and trust that something impossible is going to happen. And that's a hard choice. You got this in your hand, it makes sense, or trust God with something impossible. So verse 15 says that she went ahead and did what he was asking. So let's pick up in verse 15. So as she did, she did as Elisha said, and she, and it says that, oh man, she did as Elisha said, and she and Elisha and her son continued to eat for many days. Verse 16 is my favorite. There was always enough. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in her container, just as the Lord had promised. This challenges me. It challenges me because sometimes um, instead of surrendering, it's easier for us to sit in our feelings. Like she could have just sat in her feelings. Like sometimes it's easier for me to be like, this is painful and I'm discouraged and I'm broken when the wheels fall off. But instead, she said, I'm gonna surrender. And I think sometimes that's hard for us to do is surrender what we think might be impossible. My, my husband and I have lived a very public story recently um, that has included some heartbreak. And, um, and if, for those of you guys that are like, who is this woman? Um, really quickly, we moved about a year ago to Uganda um, to begin the process of adopting a little girl and doing ministry there. And before we left, we heard a word from the Lord and he said, you can trust me. So we clung to that promise. And every step of the way, before we even left, God did impossible thing after impossible thing. And so we went 
We got there last June. Our little girl immediately moved in with us and started doing life with us, and it was awesome, awesome, until it wasn't awesome. And we got this phone call one day, um, and the wheels started coming off. And our adoption agency said, we can't go any farther with helping you because you see her mom has withdrawn consent and so she's no longer eligible to be adopted. And so we were uh, feeling all the feels, like can't really verbalize all of that yet, like, but we felt all the feelings. We walked through grief of a loss of this child, of an idea of what our th we thought our life was gonna be like. Um, we were angry. Uh, we walked through denial, like trying to fix it. If you had an idea of how we could have fixed the situation, we already had it, and we had already tried to fix the situation. And so we spent a couple months just trying to figure out what next. And I remember last November, I remember having a moment where Daniel and I were talking, and I told him, I said, I'm, I'm frustrated and I'm disappointed. And it was like, as soon as I said that word disappointed, the Holy Spirit dropped something in me. And I remembered a verse in Isaiah that says, those who put their trust in the Lord will not be put to shame. And one translation says, will not be disappointed. And I was convicted. I was convicted because we had been trusting the Lord. We trusted the Lord to move over there and that it was all gonna work out. And then when the wheels came off, we started being like, ah, what do we do? And so I had a moment where I had to choose, do I wanna surrender this to God or do I wanna keep trying to control the situation? So that night I, I decided I was, gonna, I was gonna confess to the Lord that I had stopped trusting him. And then I was gonna risk hoping again. And then I was gonna give him the last bit that I had left in my jar. You know, like when there's a peanut butter jar and you get a spatula to try to get the last bit of peanut butter out to make a sandwich for your kid? Like, I don't even know if I had peanut butter left at the bottom of my jar. But I was like, here you go, I'm gonna give it to you. And if, if you would have told me a year ago that I'd be standing here today preaching this message, I would not have believed that that was the way our story was going to end. But y'all, I watched God do something crazy because I gave him what I had left in my jar, which wasn't a lot, but I gave it to him and I surrendered it to him again. And we watched this beautiful, crazy, impossible story of re reconciliation and restoration of a family. And we got to love this little girl and we got to tell her about Jesus and we got to help her to discover who her biological father was and tell him about Jesus. There's a lot of really cool stuff that I could keep sharing about the story. But what I learned is that God writes better stories than me. That if I trust him with the pen to be the author of my story, he's gonna write a better story than I could ever imagine. Something I was thinking about this week and in the story of the widow giving what she had is it said she always had enough after she surrendered. And it possibly could have meant that like the Lord gave her a sack of flour and a jar of olive oil that was gonna last her for the next couple years of the drought. But if I'm being honest, I think it probably meant just enough. He gave her enough to be able to last that day or maybe the next day. And then she had to trust him again. She had to keep surrendering and trusting that God was gonna do the impossible and take care of her. And I think sometimes we forget that, like we surrender a situation to the Lord and we're like, here God, have your way. But then we take it back once the wheels fall off or once we get tired, when we have to daily surrender what we have in our hand to the Lord and trust that he can write a good story. If I can encourage you guys today with anything, it would be that as a mother, the best thing you could do is to pursue an active relationship with the Lord and engage in an active and a loving relationship with the Lord. Talk to God, get in your word, get in a small group so that you can daily surrender what you have and be replenished by the Lord. There's nothing better than that. I wanna close really quick with a verse in Matthew. 
11, 28. And it says, Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and carry a heavy burden and I will give you rest. And all the mamas in here said, amen. I could use a nap. But y'all, the rest that comes from Jesus is better than any rest that we could get. And he takes our heavy burdens and the impossible situations. And he says, come here, come here. I'm gonna give you peace, I'm gonna give you rest. And so I think the common thing that all of us up here have shared today is that we've faced a lot of impossible situations and we've been in situations where the wheels have fallen off and we've had to trust the Lord. And we wanted to encourage you guys today to do the same. And as we're wrapping up, I'd love to pray. And the women up here would love to pray and extend a hand over you to pray a blessing and pray healing and pray rest over you. So if you guys would close your eyes. Before we start praying, um, I would just like to encourage anyone that really could use a dose of rest that only the Lord could, could provide or a healing that only the Lord could provide, a miracle in your life. If, if you can relate to anything that these women up here have shared today, if you would just extend your hand so that we can pray over you guys. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you love us. We thank you that you, God, are the author and the sustainer of our life, that there is nothing that we can do that could separate us from your love. God, we trust that you give rest that is better than anything else. It says in your word that you can renew our strength. And so I pray over these women today that are here, that are representing families. Lord, I pray that you would renew and refresh and rejuvenate the women in this room that are in the trenches raising their kids. The mothers in this room that have teenagers that don't know how it's gonna turn out, that you would renew their strength. God, I pray for the women that are in this room that are broken. They're looking to God for a miracle, that are asking for healing, for something impossible. God, I pray that you would, you would touch them, that you would bring your healing power, and that a year from now, they'd be able to look back and be like, man, God, I can't believe what you have done. God, I pray for the women in this room that are seeking comfort. God, that are, are mourning a loss. God, you give peace unlike anything else. And so we pray and believe that you can just give the women in this room peace. We thank you, Lord, for the gift that it is to be a mother. And I pray, Father, that we would not take that lightly. And God, that we would raise our children to be a display of your splendor. In Jesus' name, amen.